Live from Case at 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. And we begin tonight with new information in an unsolved murder case. Newly released surveillance images showing the moments before and after someone shot and killed a woman nearly two years ago. That woman was 29 year old Shaniqua Brown. As San Antonio police worked to identify the suspects, Brown's mother spoke with our Jaffney Gray about this tragic incident. Husband ran in and said they shot Shaniqua. Nearly two years later, Alberta Rutland is still reliving that tragic night she lost her daughter and best friend, 29 year old Shaniqua Brown. She was a gift from God. I just missed putting my arms around her and just rocking with her. In the early morning hours of July 12, 2020, San Antonio police say Brown and her husband were sitting in their car right outside her town home in the 2100 block of Northeast Loop 410. Moments before the shooting, surveillance video shows this dark colored car pulling up alongside a building. If you look closely, you can see the suspect in the passenger side wearing a white t-shirt. He shuts the door and changes into an all black hoodie before getting out. Police say the suspect fired several shots at the couple's car, hitting Shaniqua before he runs to get in the dark colored car again, which you see in this camera angle. Shaniqua died on her brother's birthday. It's just going to always be a constant reminder when he had the birthday that his sister was killed. Rutland says her daughter, who leaves behind two young children, was a great mother. She says Brown had a passion for helping at risk children with a dream of one day opening her own center. She knew with bullying and some of the heartaches that teenagers and youngsters face, she wanted to try to help help them. That's why she was such an influence at the Hector Garza Center where she worked. Rutland says her mission now is to provide the best quality of life for her two grandchildren while seeking justice for her daughter. You know, your day's coming. It may not be here on earth, but in the end, God will take care of it all. Now, you can take a closer look at the surveillance footage the San Antonio police released by visiting our website at ksat.com. If you could identify this dark colored vehicle or the suspects, you're urged to call Crime Stoppers. That number is 210-224-STOP. At Public Safety Headquarters, Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. A San Antonio police officer no longer on the force after being accused of drinking and driving. That's according to suspension records. Matthew Mintz was arrested and a DWI charge put against him in 2018. In November of that year, he was pulled over by Universal City Police and arrested on suspicion of driving while intoxicated. Records show that Mintz was then placed on unpaid leave. Now, according to Bear County court records, the criminal charges against Mintz were dismissed last October because of insufficient evidence. SAPD did not formally fire Mintz until last month. San Antonio police looking for answers after a body was found at a north side apartment complex. This happened right before 730 this morning in the 2300 block of Nacogdoches Road near Loop 410. SAPD says that a head contractor went to check in on two of his workers who were staying overnight at the job site. And when he got there, one of them was dead. The other one was missing. So officers think that the two got into some sort of a fight and one of them killed the other. Eventually, police found the other co-worker and arrested him. He was armed and now homicide investigators are speaking with him. At this point, it's unclear how the man was killed or if this was in self-defense. San Antonio police are trying to figure out what caused a fight between two brothers meantime that ended with their mother being cut by a knife. This happened around 1.30 this morning in the 1000 block of West Mistletoe Avenue. That's near I-10 and Blanco. Officers say the two men were fighting in front of their mother when one pulled out a knife. That's when the mother intervened, but she was cut on the hand. SAPD now determining whether any charges might be filed. Big endorsement for the Democratic challenger on the race for Texas's 28th congressional district. This weekend, Jessica Cisneros is going to be joined by Representative Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez from New York. They're having a canvas lunch, a launch, excuse me, in San Antonio. AOC is expected to throw her support behind Cisneros, who's trying to beat incumbent Henry Cuellar. Now, the representative himself has responded saying, quote, this election is taking place in the 28th congressional district of Texas, not New York City. End quote. And just a reminder that early voting for the March primaries begins on Monday. Right now on KSAT.com, we've got everything you need to know before heading out to the polls. You can find your polling locations, details on changes that have been made since the last election, as well as a look at sample ballots. 
Just go to our website or scan the QR code you see right here on your screen. Let's turn now to the newest COVID-19 numbers in Bear County. Today, Metro Health reporting more than 800 new cases and eight more people have died. Meanwhile, there are 785 COVID patients in local hospitals, 211 people in the ICU and 112 people on ventilators. And just a reminder that you can get rid of your big bulky items tomorrow because it's San Antonio's free landfill day. You can drop off your stuff at two locations. You see them right there on your screen. The first is the Republic Services landfill and the second is at the Waste Management landfill, which is over on the southwest side, right near the Joint Base San Antonio, Lackland and Medina training annex. Now both locations are going to be open from eight to one. He is battling a heart condition and she designs custom shoes and now they're teaming up for American Heart Month. RJ Marcus tells us about this young teen's journey and the surprise message that he received from one of his favorite Spurs players to keep on fighting. Isaiah Lucio enjoys doing the things that most 13 year olds like to do. He likes spending time with family and friends, playing video games and loves basketball, especially the Spurs. Who are your favorite players right now? DeJounte Murray and Kellen Johnson. And I just started liking him, how he plays, how he hustles, his nickname, the big body. It's that type of spirit that's helped Isaiah through a tough time. He was diagnosed with heart failure in October. It was sad and tough, but I, I got through it. Isaiah had open heart surgery in Austin in November. Doctors put a ventricular assist device, or a VAD, to help his heart get ready for a transplant. But it allowed him to go back home right before Christmas. I was really scared at first, but I still got it. And during his time in the hospital, Isaiah's family connected with Kate Orozco, a San Antonio artist who designs custom shoes under the name Custom Kate. Isaiah's mom ordered him a pair of fiesta theme kicks, but they saw an opportunity to help kids in a similar situation. Me and Isaiah decided to design a few pairs of shoes to raffle off um, for um, to raise uh, money for the American Heart Association. Kate says all proceeds will go to the Heart Association. You could get through something so tough. I feel like that's very inspiring for a lot of people. Isaiah has been through a lot throughout his life, several open heart surgeries, and he continues to be a fighter. And he's also gotten a lot of support from his, of course, family, friends, loved ones, classmates, teachers, the school, also getting a little bit of love from one of his favorite Spurs players. What's up, Isaiah? It's Keldon Johnson here, man. Um, man, I just want to give you a shout out and say hello, man. And, you know, they told me about, you know, your heart surgery and that uh, I'm just here to tell you, keep your hopes up, man, and uh, stay in positive spirits and that I'm always here for you, man. And, man, I wish you the best. Go Spurs, go. A surprise message from KJ to keep Isaiah pushing forward. How does that make you feel? I'm great. RJ Marquez, KSAT 12 News. Love that. Shoes are awesome. Yes, message even I better. Know. All right, from Eagle Pass to SoFi Stadium in Inglewood, California, one local man is headed to the Super Bowl. That's right. Roberto Cardona grew up in the Texas Mexico border town, later graduated from Our Lady of the Lake University, and now he's an athletic trainer for the Cincinnati Bengals. Alicia Barrera talked to Cardona on the road about what Sunday's big game means to him. Roberto Cardona is living the Texas football dream. They always dream. Being, being able to play for the, the Lombardi Trophy, even if I'm not the one playing. He helps keep Cincinnati Bengal athletes, including quarterback Joe Burrow and tight end CJ Uzama, strong and healthy. I'm an assistant athletic trainer with the Cincinnati Bengals. We uh, deal with the prevention, uh, care, rehabilitation, and treatment of athletic injuries, and that, that starts in, in the offseason. But it all started along the Texas-Mexico border with the support of his parents. I was born in, in Mexico, uh, Piedras Negras, Coahuila, um, raised in Eagle Pass. Been around San Antonio all my life, really. After completing his undergrad at Our Lady of the Lake University, he went on to get his master's at Texas Tech's Health Sciences Center and worked for UTSA, Louisiana Tech. And in 2017, he finally got his start in the NFL. I got the opportunity to be an athletic training fellow with the Cincinnati Bengals. I was had the opportunity for that two years, um, was promoted to assistant athletic trainer. Now it's time to focus as the Bengals will make their first Super Bowl appearance in 33 years as they face off against the L.A. Rams Sunday. Now we got to finish off strong and, and, and uh, complete the ultimate goal, right? Alicia Barrera, KSAT 12 News. 
All right, now we're going to take a live look outside. Here's our camera here on the south side. 73 degrees. Lovely day for the rodeo, I would say. Of course. Uh, of course, though, it's not rodeo without a cold front. Adam. Oh, and we're going to have that early tomorrow morning before sunrise. We're going to have that cold front hit us right now. Anything but a cold front 73 degrees dew point of 41. So a lack of mugginess in the air, of course, with that dew point near 40 temperatures, though, still in the 70s for most of us. Uvalde 75, 77 Stinson. You get to Bulverde 71 in Canyon Lake, about 66. But the rest of us, for the most part, in the 70s and temperatures comfortable this evening. 8 p.m. 64, 10 o'clock, still near 60 degrees. Clear sky, not much of a breeze. The cold front, it's basically near I-20 right now, North Texas. Going to make it here before sunrise. We'll talk about what that means for temperatures tomorrow and even the wind speed. We'll see you in a bit. All right, so tonight on the Night Beat, we're going to have a new look into the response into this morning's human smuggling case on the far west side. What police witnessed as they first arrived on the scene. Plus, caves like these replenish the San Antonio water supply. Keeping them clean from trash is a must to preserve water quality. Tonight on the Night Beat, we'll speak with geologists about cave conservation. All right, let's take a look at our roads at this hour. Let's go to the TransGuide camera here at 281 in the quarry. This is a familiar sight this time of day. The southbound lanes backed up as you're heading into downtown, but things flowing just fine if you're headed towards Loop 410. All right. Now here's a heads up. Just watch out for a major construction project in Kendall County this weekend because it's going to lead to several closures along I-10. So what changes can drivers expect to see? Our Stephen Cavazos with his Traffic Authority report. If you have big plans this weekend up in Kendall County, you definitely want to plan ahead. We have some big closures out there that again, you're going to want to be aware of. Let's go ahead and take you in up to Kendall County there off of I-10. Now this closure is going to be a long one, a 56 hour continuous closure of the full main lanes of the I-10 and eastbound uh, travel lanes between State Highway 46 and US 87. Now this removal of this bridge will actually allow crews out there to start working on the new westbound State Highway 46 bridge construction that Again, we'll take some time, but this will all start at eight in the evening and wrap Monday morning. So let's take a closer look in as you talk about some travel routes there for drivers. Now the westbound lanes of I-10, keep in mind that the frontage road traffic will continue through the state highway 46 intersection, then get back onto the main lanes at the next available entrance ramp. Now that's located near Fredericks Creek. Keep in mind off duty uniformed officers are going to control that traffic movement right at the state highway 46 intersection. So be on the lookout for them. And if you are going to be traveling east Eastbound. Let's take a look there because the frontage road traffic will continue through the state highway 46 intersection, then get back onto the main lanes at the next available entrance ramp. Now that's located west of the US 87 interchange. Another off duty officer. Again, keep in mind they're going to be out there controlling that traffic moving at the intersection there at state highway 46. Again, as a reminder, this will all start at eight in the evening Friday and will continue throughout the weekend and wrap up Monday morning, according to TxDOT. And I stay with KSAT for the very latest on this construction up there in I. Yeah, you know where there's probably traffic right now. The rodeo, baby. Of course, we're heading into the first full weekend of the rodeo. If you're headed out there, boots and a jacket, Adam. Absolutely, and stressing the boots, right, Myra? <laughs> <laughs> I left mine in the garage when I uh, arrived home after being in the <laughs> yeah, barn. So that's, that's that was a good call. The appropriate thing to yeah. do, and yes, it's that time of year, and it's not rodeo without a cold front. Get get ready. Here comes a cold front early tomorrow morning. Now today we started at 40 degrees, so a cool start. Then 76 by the afternoon, so big temperature spread today. We get that when we have full sunshine and dry air, low dew points. Okay, Hondo did not have a high of 95. Obviously that's an error right there reported, but we did make it to 80 degrees. Del Rio 84, the high, Creasel Springs topped out at 81 and Catula 82. Take a look at the temperatures right now because that colder air to the north of us, it's on its way to our neck of the woods and it's gonna be here tomorrow and it's, it's going to have an impact on temperatures, yes, and you'll, you'll notice the cool, windy conditions tomorrow, but it's not going to be a drastic cold front like what we've had in recent history over the past couple of weeks. But the readings now, 
comfortable and relatively warm for this time of year. Catula 80, Del Rio 82. You still 71 in Kerrville and New Braunfels, 77 in Pleasanton. Tomorrow, most of the day is just going to be in the low to mid 50s. Looks like a high temperature of 55 degrees tomorrow afternoon. Then we rebound nicely into the 60s on Sunday. Back to 70 degrees on Monday, Valentine's Day, and we should be 70 degrees for most of next week. All right, here's a look at the satellite and radar with that cold front. Nothing along it. This is having a hard time getting any showers going, and it's going to struggle even as it moves into our neck of the woods. Most of the moisture with this far to the north and northeast of us. We'll have a slight chance of a few showers, but unfortunately it doesn't look like it's going to add up to much. Of course, we could use the rain. 78% of Texas is in drought, which is actually a little improvement compared to this time last week. You see the Gulf coastline. That's where we actually don't have drought conditions, but you get Dimmit, LaSalle, McMullen counties here. Catula, Tilden, Fowlerton, Los Angeles, Carrizo Springs, even there. That's where we have the deepest drought in our area and actually half of Bear County or about a third of Bear County is considered within drought and that's mainly the western portion. So 78% of the state in, in drought and this cold front's not going to bring us much rain. Other parts of the state should get some good rain by the middle of next week around here. Eh, unfortunately, doesn't look like we'll tap into a whole lot, but as this cold front hits tomorrow, a few hit or miss light showers or sprinkles. We're talking a few hundredths of an inch here and there, especially east of I-35. But the main headline with this front, obviously it's going to be cooler, but especially the gusty winds. I mean, we're expecting wind gusts in excess of 40 miles per hour tomorrow. So gusts between 40 and 45 miles per hour with that cooler air. It's going to be noticeable, especially coming down from the 70s back into the 50s tomorrow, 52 in the morning, and then we're only going to make it to 55 for the high temperature. So not a big difference from the morning to the afternoon. Basically anticipate low 50s most of the day tomorrow with those high wind gusts, a steady north wind at 20 to 30 gusting at times up to 45. That's going to lead us to a cold Sunday morning. The wind will subside. However, Sunday morning, a light freeze at about 30 degrees for a few hours early in the morning. By the afternoon, as we talked about, back into the mid 60s. So sunny in mid 60s, Super Bowl Sunday, beautiful weather to be outside and uh, soak in that sunshine. Now we get into Valentine's Day, it's back to 70 degrees and we're going to be there for most of next week. However, it does look like another cold front will greet us on Thursday and that should get us back to freezing by Friday morning. Just a light freeze. Notice our rain chances around here just at 20 to 30 percent Wednesday and Thursday, but at least it is looking promising for other parts of Texas. We just be on the tail end of it as we so often are. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Adam. All right, so the Spurs didn't do so well against the Cavaliers, but it's a new day. They're in hot Atlanta now. And absolutely, they can do better than they did last game, of course. Hopefully, Hopefully they can beat the Atlanta Hawks tonight. It's going to be the new look Spurs. It's going to be weird not seeing Derek White on the team. And Zach Collins says coming up to that trade deadline is just a crazy time. Plus, the Lytle Pirates are your back-to-back -back district champions. They're playing some good ball coming up. New York Spurs will continue the rodeo road trip tonight at the Atlanta Hawks. The Birds are looking to sweep the two-game series with the Spurs. Yesterday, the Silver and Black traded Derek White, Drew Eubanks, and Thad Young before the deadline. Zach Collins says the trade deadline can be a trip. My rookie year had a couple times where, you know, after a shoot-around, we had a game that day. After a shoot-around, I had a, you know, one of our teammates was gone. You know, it's just kind of, they went through the whole scout with us, and he was gone, you know, when shoot-around was over. So it's a crazy business, man. Yes, it is. Here's your matchup. Spurs at the Hawks coming up at 630 tonight. This afternoon, we stopped by Lytle High School to catch up with the girls basketball team led by head coach and athletic director Lori Wilson. The Pirates recently won their second straight district championship. They finished the regular season 24 and 9 overall and 14 and 2 in District 27 3A. Going back to back in district as the team to beat certainly feels great. It feels great, um, obviously. Um, I, I had a gut feeling we would. I mean, we worked really hard since last year in the summer, came out to practice a lot. So I, it's, a good, it's a good feeling. So I'll hopefully make it past first, second round, hopefully make it to regionals, all that. Yeah, it made me feel so great. It made me feel like how much of a leader I am to this team. And it made me feel how much we had to work harder mm -hmm. since we lost some players. Winning back-to-back -back champs is a big accomplishment for this team. 
And now the Pirates are getting ready to face the Tidehaven Tigers in the first round of the UIL playoffs. Tidehaven is 19 and 12 and plays in District 28-3A. And the awesome thing about this is we had a bye week during district, and so I loaded up the starters and we drove down to Edna, Texas. So we've seen the girls, so we're very confident. They have good shooters and um, a couple good ball handlers, so we have to play awesome defense. It's going to take our defense and putting pressure on their guards. Um, I don't think, and putting our full court press on them. So our defense, I'm pretty sure, can take over the game. Belida will face Tidehaven in the Class 3A by district playoffs Tuesday night at 630 in Cuero. Yesterday at Bernie High School, Rashawn Galloway signed his national letter of intent to further his academic and athletic career at Texas State University. He's a tremendous football player, one of the best in the area, but he signed with the Bobcats to play baseball. So why did he pick Texas State? Uh, coaching staff and the facilities. I fell in love with the coaches. The uh, since day one, they said they were going to give me a shot as soon as I walked on campus. So, I mean, that's always a good feeling. And um, just the facilities they have, I mean, it's only about an hour and a half away from home. Um, it's right there. They're doing more and more renovations every year. So, I mean, it's a really cool opportunity. How exciting is this day for you and your family? Uh, very exciting. I mean, it's a really cool opportunity to get to spend this with my family and friends alongside. So, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a blessing to say the least. The Taps High School swimming season ends today. Josh Davis Natatorium with the Division II state championships. And the TMI girls are once again state champions. Sophomore Emily Kiriyama led the way with two individual titles in the 200 and 500 yard freestyles, while junior Meredith Holcomb added a pair of second place finishes to help the Panthers repeat as champs. I am so proud of these girls. They worked, like, they worked their butts off this season. You can see the major improvement of all of the girls, and they contributed so much to this team. St. Mary's Hall's Ethan Doler set multiple state records and was named the male swimmer of the meet. You can hear from him right now on the BGC page at KSAT.com. All right, Larry, thank you. Uh -huh. Now, coming up, we all know this, the city loves to party, so why not, why not hold a multi-day event to celebrate local indoor-outdoor bars? We're going to tell you more about Ice House Week right after the break. Welcome back. So let's face it, San Antonio loves a good celebration, and that's why, I mean, why not have an Ice House Week? <laughs> this is going to be a 10-day long event celebrating the city's most vibrant indoor, indoor, outdoor bars and restaurants. And joining us now to talk about Ice House Week is Kent Oliver, the owner of Dakota Eastside Ice House. Kent, thanks for being here, taking some time away from this beautiful background. We want to hang out with you, but here we are. So let's talk about Ice House Week. What is this event all about? I'm sorry, I missed that last thing you said. I'm sorry. Well, this is what happens when you do interviews at bars. What, what is Ice House Week all about? We just really wanted to come together and spotlight all the um, small businesses, especially um, that have suffered over the last couple of years. Um, and ice houses are just so San Antonio. You know, our, our culture here has re revolved around the neighborhood ice house for so long. And, you know, after a few years of, of the decline in, in them, it seems like now even more than before, um, there's a resurgence. And um, with Ice House Week, we just, like I said, wanted to spotlight these these uh, treasures because, they're, you know, some of, particularly some of the older places, um, are just so uniquely San Antonio. Um, it's something that we definitely need to preserve as we move forward. So tell us, how many places are participating? I checked on your website at last count, it was 27, but tell us about some of these places. So there's 27 participants as of now. We're uh, expecting to get more in the next week, uh, right before it starts. Um, it's really, a, a, it varies. Everyone varies, it doesn't have to be in the name, Ice House doesn't have to be in the name, it just has to be like the spirit, the spirit of the Ice House, um, which is just a community gathering place. Um, and so that's how we, we kind of approached all these different um, people and businesses to become a part of this. And we should mention those dates, I'm sure people wondering, February 25th through March 6th, that is the official Ice House week. Talk a little bit about the pandemic. You mentioned the impact of that. We know it has been tough, especially on businesses where people normally right. gather in groups in large numbers. So talk about right. what the last couple of years have been like for your business. They have, yeah, they have been very interesting, to say the least. Um, 
you know, we had to basically, basically we had to move all of our business outside as so many other places had to do. Um, looking back on it, it was kind of a silver lining of everything because it made us to the place we are today. And that was just the silver lining of, of COVID, but it was so hard to, um, you know, we had to go to, to basically all of uh, to go business and, and um, outdoor and to have everybody spaced appropriately. And um, our goal is just to try to provide a safe place for people to come out in a time that people couldn't come out. Um, and so I think we did that very well. But some of the smaller places that, that um, they've really suffered because they weren't able to get maybe as much assistance they needed to get or didn't qualify because of the way they have things set up. Um, and so we're hoping that this week will also spotlight those places so that they um, get recognized and that, that people won't forget that they're there and we can continue um, that long tradition. And what's your pitch to people? So we already know you got 27 places uh, participating in this, but what's your pitch to people who you want to come out and, uh, and you know, patronize these these bars? So what, you know, what well, would you tell them? For, for, for people who are San Antonians, they know what ice houses are all about. And they've lived that culture, and it's really, really a fun time. The weather is going to be great. It looks like it's going to be great, and we're excited about that. Um, for people who've just moved to San Antonio, which so many people have in the last few years, um, I think it's an opportunity for them to really uh, see a unique part of San Antonio culture and um, hang out with some of their neighbors. That's what it's all about. We're showing a list right now of those 27 mm -hmm. places that are taking part in this. And, and you're right, there's a wide variety on there. So there really is something for everybody who wants to get together and especially be outside, Definitely. enjoy all of this. Talk about where this idea came from. I mean, how did this designating this week really come to be? It was actually uh, my, myself and um, and Jody Newman, who owns the, uh, the Friendly Spot, we uh, had been talking about it. We started talking about it during COVID and just, it was something that we wanted to do, like I said, just to shine a spotlight on some of the places that we knew were struggling so hard. Um, and that's really how it came about. We just talked about it. We talked about it for two years almost. Um, and then in November, we met with folks there at The Current and uh, kind of pitched them the idea uh, and they've just really run with it. You know, we've gotten sponsorship and um, it's just been really, really great. Great to see see so many people interested and excited. Now, the, the cherry on top for this is the fact that if you go to these, if you participate in Ice House Week, a portion of the proceeds are going to go toward helping out local small right. businesses, right? Tell us more about that. Through, through Lift Fund. Yes, a portion of the proceeds will be go to Lift Fund. And Lift Fund is, is a great service, a great mm -hmm. business here in San Antonio that provides help to small businesses and you know the small businesses are the lifeblood of the city and so we, we definitely wanted to turn that support around back to someone who would who would pay it forward all right perfect so we got the details up here again february 25th to march 6th 27 participating ice houses you can find all the information saicehouseweek.com kent oliver owner of dakota east side ice house good luck with this event i hope that it brings a lot of people together does good for local business and it's just a good time so thanks so much for being yeah, here today it is. thank you so much yeah now go back to your party <laughs> we'll, we'll be, be right, right back, back. All right, we have this here around America. The Senate now advancing a controversial bill that reignites the debate over tech platforms legal protection. So this is legislation that's known as Earn It Act of 2022, and it targets how websites handle child sex abuse. And under the bill, states could bring civil and criminal lawsuits against a tech platform that knowingly facilitates the spread of child pornography. Right now, tech platforms can only face federal prosecution. The bill would also create a commission that would publish voluntary best practices. Now, that would effectively tell websites how they could earn their liability protections. Amazon workers who are vaccinated against COVID-19 will no longer have to wear masks in warehouses in some states. The retail giant announcing today that it is lifting the requirement for workers in states that have eased up on their mask mandates. Employees who are not vaccinated or who work in states where mask regulations are still in place will continue to have to mask up. Amazon says it made that decision due to a sharp decline in COVID cases across the country.
All right, now let's get ready. Let's talk about Super Bowl 56 and the showdown between the L.A. Rams and the Cincinnati Bengals. Law enforcement ramping up security patrols, of course, ahead of that game. The National Weather Service also issuing a warning about the heat in L.A. ABC's Morgan Norwood has the latest on the final preps for Sunday. We're just days away from one of the biggest games in sports, Super Bowl 56 taking over Inglewood, California, with thousands set to descend on SoFi Stadium in the heart of LA County. Sorry. Authorities are executing their own game plans, ramping up security across the area using bomb sniffing dogs, numerous aircraft, and speedboats to monitor waterways. This is a workforce of more than 9,500 police officers and, and we are we stand ready. The Department of Homeland Security had warned of potential truck protests near the stadium, similar to what's happening in Canada. The LAPD says they're monitoring the situation closely. We are aware that there's been some aspirational remarks on social media and we have contingencies already in place to ensure that no one is going to interrupt this. And for the first time in now during the show, always so nice. It's my favorite time of year when we get that. It officially sets at 6.20 p.m., so it's down, but you still get that twilight out there, and it's going to get dark pretty soon and pretty quickly now, and that's when temperatures start to fall off. 73 degrees currently at the airport, dew point of 41, so no mugginess in the air, of course. And we'll see those temperatures fall off pretty quickly. I mean, by 11 o'clock, we'll be in the mid-50s, and then tomorrow morning in the lower 50s, about 52 degrees at sunrise. But the cold front's already going to be here then. We'll talk about what that means for the rest of the day and the rest of the weekend coming up. All right, in the buzz today, Ed Sheeran and Taylor Swift giving fans what they want, a new duet. The Joker and the Queen released last night. Sheeran initially released a solo version of the song in last October as part of his fifth studio album. But this latest version features Swift and a very nostalgic music video. Fans might remember Sheeran and Swift's first collaboration, Everything's Changed, which was back in 2012. The Joker and the Queen is Sheeran and Swift's fourth collaboration. Good stuff. Now, Miami Airport handling hundreds of thousands of flowers every day to get ready for Valentine's Day, which is, Adam? Monday. There you go, Monday. The airport receives 91% of all flowers that are imported into the U.S., primarily from South American countries like Colombia and Ecuador. The annual total amount is more than 236,000 tons of flowers, valued at nearly $1.2 billion every year. Wow. Millions of miles away in space, a traveling probe is giving us a first look at the surface of Venus. The highly detailed images from NASA showing the surface of this mysterious planet. The visible light images were captured by the Parker Solar Probe. It uses a wide field filter able to see through the clouds of Venus. Now scientists say that the chemical data suggests that Venus may have been habitable in the past. Other data gathered by the probe could help them learn more information about this, not just about the planet's geology, but also its evolutionary history as well. So fascinating stuff. Those are always Really cool to look yeah. At. Okay, speaking of cool, that's what we are going to do this weekend. <laughs> Temperatures yes. going to drop, Adam. Layer up, I guess. Yeah, they are. And you're going to notice it mainly tomorrow and then into Sunday morning. Then we rebound pretty quickly and nicely. But the cold front hits before sunrise tomorrow. A windy and cool Saturday. Nothing like some previous cold fronts. But it'll be noticeable, of course, having been in the 70s for a few days. And then a Sunday morning freeze. So let's get right to it. Take a look at our beautiful live cam shot. 73 degrees right now. Dew point of 41, and I do think that you'll notice a little bit of humidity by the middle of next week, around Wednesday. It's something we haven't really felt much of lately, but Wednesday you'll notice a little bit of stickiness back in the air. And temperatures right now still 80 degrees Catula, 82 Del Rio. Those are the outliers. We're 68 in Gonzales, 65 in Kerrville, and right now 67 in Beeville. And you look across the state, this is actually where we have a cold front off to the north. Notice not a very sharp temperature drop behind the front. Front's roughly along I-20. Behind it into the panhandle, we're in the 50s right now. You head farther to the north and temperatures dip below zero. Fargo International Falls below zero. That's obviously the core of the cold air and the core of it's going to stay north of us. We're just getting clipped by this colder air mass and all the moisture associated with it is far to the north of us as well. We could generate a few of our own showers 
around here, but odds are against it. Not many of us will actually see any moisture from this cold front when it moves in tomorrow. Here's our future cast. It hits around 4 a.m. That's when it hits up San Antonio and Highway 90. And the wind's going to pick going to pick up pretty quickly behind this cold front. Give it a couple of hours and the wind's going to be howling. But notice the future the future cast also showing a few little showers popping up here and there, generally east of I-35. Not a whole lot in terms of coverage and not a whole lot in terms of any accumulation. Maybe a few hundredths of an inch here and there. So pretty insignificant in terms of that slight rain chance. But the wind, I think that's going to be the headline tomorrow. The gusty winds and we're accustomed to that with our cold fronts that we've had this winter. We've had some pretty gusty and breezy days and tomorrow. No exception by nine o'clock. We're already 25 miles per hour and I do think we'll see some wind gusts up to about 40 to 45 miles per hour throughout the day tomorrow. So windy and of course cooler. Take a look at the temperatures. This is what we're expecting tomorrow morning for the most part near 50 degrees, but some 40s in the hill country. Of course into the afternoon, not much of a change. We're just going to climb about five or six degrees from sunrise to sunset. So not a big temperature spread from when you step out in the morning to when you go to bed later on at night. We'll be in the 50s most of the day tomorrow with that gusty wind. Uh, we're talking about 54 Stone Oak for a high 57 Castroville and Elmendorf and Lavernia about 57 for that high. You look at looking at it in a different way. I like to put it into a line graph format and it's pretty much a flat line here. 52 in the morning, 55 by 3 p.m. And then after sunset, we'll see the temperature start to fall off. And that's actually when the wind is going to subside a bit. But notice our our high temperatures, they rebound quite a bit. I mean, we're going to be back into the 70s by early next week. So here you have it 70 by early next week, even mid 60s on Sunday. But I want to point out we talked about the windy and cooler Saturday. That's going to lead to a light freeze Sunday morning right at about 30 degrees and then sunny in 60s by the afternoon. So rebounding nicely and then next week, as I mentioned, right near 70. There's a shot at a few showers by Wednesday and Thursday. It's actually looking like a pretty potent upper level system that's going to affect Texas, just not so much our part of Texas. <laughs> right. That's the key, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks, Adam. And in case you missed it, coming up next. Good morning to you. We hope you slept well last night and are ready for a great weekend here in South Texas. It is Friday the 11th. San Antonio police have received a call about a big rig with people who were climbing out of the back of it. Officers got here pretty quickly. They noticed the same thing and some of those people began to scatter all over the shopping center. A man who died at a house fire this week is identified now as 47 year old Jimmy Anthony de Hoyos. His home on Misty Plain Drive in West Bear County caught fire on on Wednesday, the Ogos body wasn't found until a secondary search of that home hours later. Firefighters told us the house was cluttered, which made it difficult to put out the fire and get into the house. It's going to be a while before kids under the age of five get their COVID vaccines. Remember how we told you Pfizer was trying to get emergency use authorization to use its vaccine on the youngest kids? Well, now U.S. regulators are saying, hold on. The FDA wants Pfizer and BioNTech to finish studying how an extra low dose of the vaccine affects kids under five. It also wants to know whether kids are going to need a third dose. But Pfizer says that that data isn't going to be ready until April. So there's no telling when that age group is going to be able to go out and get their vaccines. This week, the Maryland crossing officer holding up her hand for a car to stop while the middle school across the street, the car didn't stop and clipped Corporal Annette Goodyear. But as she was doing that, you can see it again in slow motion. She was able to push that middle schooler out of the way before that car got the little girl. But it did get the officer. The video has been seen worldwide. The officer is still a little sore, but she is back at work and receiving all kinds of accolades for heroic actions. <laughs> Tomorrow, windy and cool will be in the low to mid 50s pretty much all day with some wind gusts at times 40 to 45 miles per hour. Luckily, the wind's going to subside Saturday night because Sunday morning will be around 30 degrees. Of course, cooler in some outlying areas and then by Sunday afternoon. Sunny, not bad. Mid 60s. Good day to get out and fire up the uh, pit and smoke some meat and go to the rodeo. <laughs> all right. All right thanks, good. Adam. And thank you for watching the news at six. We'll see you on the night feed.